So I'm so excited to be here and let you guys know more about me. Oh, thank you for that. All right, uh, next up, uh, Jason, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your role at Cresco and tell us about uh, Cresco as well? Absolutely, and, and thanks for having me. So uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, grew up a small town Kansas kid. I was definitely a dare kid coming up in the 80s and, and considered cannabis, uh, as I was told, to be as dangerous as any of the other harder drugs um, that it was painted alongside. Um, was fortunate to, to take out some loans, work my way through an undergrad in, in college at Kansas State University and, and worked in a kitchen at the time. And so uh, you definitely get exposed to cannabis in a, a kitchen environment, certainly some other harder drugs, and kind of began to change my opinions of, uh, at least certainly even compared to alcohol. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll try to start the video there, see if that works. Um, I, I wrapped that degree in 2002 um, in agronomy, had nothing to do with cannabis, but soil sciences, some of the applicable sciences. Went to California, worked out there in the early medical markets, was there for four years. Um, really loved California, but the market was very volatile back then. So you had uh, the DEA would show up all the time, would, would tear down grows, uh, everybody's going home, going out in handcuffs and, and ultimately left that. It just felt too volatile for the, the lifestyle that I was looking for. Um, as Denver began to mature, I, I felt like maybe I had a chance to re-enter the cannabis industry. This is 2008, 2009. Um, they had more regulation there. I also knew I had knowledge gaps. So I took the gamble, took out some pretty more significant school loans to, uh, to go through a master's study in horticulture and floriculture, actually study the things I wanted to learn about cannabis for my previous experience, but I couldn't talk about cannabis the whole time I was there. I wrapped that uh, master's in late 2011, 2012, went to Denver for four years out there, was with a large retailer, uh, the Green Solution Cultivator, um, launched their expansion, watched that market go from medical to recreational, and at that point then um, opted to join the Illinois market. This is in 2016. This was as Cresco was just licensed and barely beginning to produce. And so in that time, I've served as a senior vice president of production for Cresco, overseeing all of the crop production across initially Illinois, and then two years into Cresco have now moved into uh, you know, 11 plus states, 12 states. Um, so oversaw that expansion. And then the most exciting prospects for me have been able to take this legacy knowledge and my academic experience now in 2020 and commit all of it towards uh, our social equity initiatives, obviously addressing the pervasive issues, not only in the cannabis industry, but in the, the country of America at large. Um, and so, yeah, it's, a, it's been a very rewarding and obviously a very challenging time for all of us to, to take advantage of this opportunity, like was mentioned, that um, depending on the fall election, even depending on these last few states that are starting to uh, consider legitimized programs, the opportunity is now um, to really address the, the issues that have been plaguing this industry and the country at large. And so what I've put together today um, is a little bit of a high level approach as a cannabis 101. Uh, we'll definitely talk a little bit about cannabis and history. Uh, we'll kind of take a look at a production facility. We'll talk about how the, um, the industry itself is certainly intertwined with different um, you know, facets, uh, professional outcomes. My hope is that we can get a general high level uh, picture of this uh, through this presentation and then certainly leave time for questions at the end. Um, so we can go ahead and slip to the next slide there. Um, take a look at the discussion outcomes, the discussion goals for today. As I said, we'll talk a little bit about can't plantibus, can't, <laughs> cannabis plant facts, um, just some fundamental information about the plant itself. Uh, definitely take a look at the ethnobotanical summary. Um, certainly, you know, prehistoric times uh, are interesting, but we'll definitely focus on, you know, certainly postmodern America and how cannabis has manifested itself. Um, and then, as I said, we'll wrap up with some modern market uh, crop production approaches. We'll look at some facility details and kind of hopefully paint the picture for everybody of what the legitimized industry looks like currently and then ultimately provide um, you guys with some context to be able to innovate and enter the space um, for us as Cresco and, and likewise the industry at large we want to be able to channel all the passion and the opportunities associated with cannabis le legitimization um, in a very prompt and, and appropriate fashion so slide to the next uh, move to the next slide there please So yeah, a quick primer on the plant itself. Uh, I'm sure most of you guys have a general working uh, knowledge of the cannabis plant, but um, just taking a historical perspective, a scientific perspective, it was first described back by Linnaeus in 1753. Linnaeus obviously did a bunch of uh, biological categorizations for plants. Um, and so ultimately, scientifically, it's been described uh, as being in the cannabidaceae family, which uh, has a cousin of hops. We'll talk a little bit about um, how those plants have certain similarities, uh, likewise how they're different. We'll talk briefly today on the species of cannabis uh, versus the subspecies of cannabis. 
And specifically pertaining to that, um, the subspecies are typically referenced as something like a sativa, indica, a hybrid as a blend of the two, or solely a CBD version or a CBD antioxidant forward version of that particular species. So whether it's hemp, sativa, indica, any of those, they all fit in the same species where they're categorized in a different fashion as a, as a subspecies categorization. Um, they're all herbaceous annuals. In nature, they would grow outside in the summer, summer and fall. They would finish their life cycle um, approaching the winter. Uh, they would die standing in places, especially where you have a frost, and, and then we would continue that life cycle with seeds that fall into ground in, in the spring. As I mentioned, hemp and cannabis are both in the same species, um, but it really is the different cannabinoid profiles that set them apart. So most people are familiar that cannabis, at least the, the cultivars that we typically work with, are THC forward primarily. Some of the other cannabinoids such as CBD, THCV, CBN are starting to get some notoriety as having different um, consumption events or medical impacts, however you want to phrase them, depending on a recreational or a medical market. Um, and a key note too is that most of the cannabis that is sold in dispensaries is the dioecious version, which means that there's a male and a female plant. Uh, a monoecious version is more akin to field hemp, which is actually the picture that you see there in the center of the screen. That particular version of cannabis has a male and a female flower part on the same plant itself. And obviously, I think most people are aware that if you have a, a, fl a flowering part that has cannabinoids, if that flowering part is seeded, um, it loses quality, it, it loses its ability to be sold, certainly as THC-based cannabis products. So just a quick little explanation as to the difference, say, between cannabis that we sell in a THC forward dispensary and something like the CBD field hemp um, that was noticed in the farm bill, essentially that's, um, you know, there, there's those two different iterations of the same species, essentially. Go to the next slide there, please. Um, so let's move into some ethnobotanical um, summaries. And right out of the gate, you can see I, I paint this plant as an unwitting weapon. Um, ultimately, not the case where it came from. Um, there's, there's accountings back to Central Asia, 8,000 8, BC, of, of those populations consuming cannabis for either medicinal, recreational, um, incense, just burning it because they enjoyed a skunky smell, I guess. Um, and obviously the plant was around before that and millennia after that. Um, it's been a partner alongside our evolution um, and, and essentially consistently um, exposed and then prol proliferated with something like the European trade routes. So if, it's, if it was, uh, the evolution was noted back to Central Asia, it was then proliferated across the world with those European trade routes. And that's where you hear the term land race genetics established. So we have a cultivar um, that's named for Durban, uh, South Africa, uh, and that, that particular genetic likely made it there thousands of years ago. It stayed there for that entire time and was uh, bred with itself, was stabilized, was, was selected by the local populations. And then now, um, you know, even late modern America, all of these genetics made their way to California initially. Um, now then these strains have proliferated out to the Midwest, heading your way in, in the southern markets here shortly. Um, and then the biggest ethnobotanical understanding that I'm sure everybody's familiar with is that, um, oh, back up real quick if you, thank you so much. Um, you know, up until 1890, early 1900s, cannabis was sold as an extract to concentrate alongside opium, alongside any of the other pharmaceuticals that they used to deem appropriate back then. And then uh, the weaponization of cannabis through um, early legislative prohibition efforts, uh, 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, obviously targeting uh, minority communities, black and brown communities um, uh, with that legislation. And obviously we, we carry forward that incarceration legislation through um, really uh, to this day, that hasn't necessarily stopped certainly in, in most states, but um, you start to see a turn of the tide with your initial medical market in California. So that came about in 1997. I took part in that medical market back in 2002, highly unregulated, definitely an infant style of program. Um, and now that we see that program has lend credence and example to uh, then forthcoming medical programs such as Denver, to recreational programs that were innovative such as Washington, Oregon, and now a spot like Illinois and other states that started medically and have now begun to transition into recreational type sales. Um, so just a quick ethnobotanical uh, summary there of, of how we got to where we are with this particular partner as a plant. Next slide, please. Um, a quick note of the what and the why. So it really is the cannabinoids that are exclusive to cannabis that make it of interest. Most people understand the THCV, 
THC, the CBD, uh, cannabinoids. Those are secondary metabolites that the plant produces primarily for stress resistance. Um, they can serve as a sunscreen. They, you know, if those of you who know that trichomes are very sticky, it makes it difficult for an insect to crawl through those flowers. Um, so ultimately, that's why the plant bothers to make them. Um, same with the terpenes. The, the terpenes are another secondary metabolite that uh, gives the plant its smell. Um, those familiar with cannabis, it can have a very skunky, uh, loud smell. Um, or uh, as you know, Tangy's nickname indicates, there's a tangy strain that smells just like oranges. Um, there's fruity floral terpene cocktails. They also um, contribute to the effect when you consume the cannabis. So um, an idea of a sativa uplifting cultivar has THC, same as an indica relaxing cultivar has THC. It's actually the different terpenes that dictate the experiential um, response when someone's consuming that. Um, and ultimately, humankind, uh, certainly us in most modern breeding efforts, have uh, chosen antioxidant-rich cultivars. So we were selecting for a certain flavor, smell, experience um, over millennia. And most recently, we've had the benefit of something like lab testing to be able to assign data uh, to that selection process. Um, but that's really what sets cannabis apart from even hops as a cousin. Hops does have terpenes. Heineken beer is skunky because the terpenes in those hops make that beer skunky. However, obviously hops don't have any of the uh, major cannabinoids that really make cannabis special. So next slide, please. There we are. So um, now that we know, you know, generally what the plant is, what we're interested in, let's take a look at some production models. Um, and what we'll just take a quick go, a quick look at high level, obviously for a producer and ultimately a dispensary, dispensary who's buying from a producer, it's a constant supply of high quality flour and extraction based oils for medicinal recreational users. Um, that's a tricky nut to crack. As I mentioned, this, this plant's an herbaceous annual. It would normally uh, vegetate, grow, flower in nature, die in the fall, and that would be the end for that individual. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how we go through that perpetual harvest and, and we'll look at an indoor greenhouse or open field production model. All of them are used depending on the states where cannabis is produced. They have their own different caveats, but in general, um, it's advantageous to go through a rotational perpetual harvest. There are certainly outdoor harvests in Colorado and California where it's an entire harvest that grows with the natural seasons. It's harvested in late fall um, and then is made market available through call it the winter, early spring months of the following year. Um, I think we can move to the next slide there with that. So just a quick note to the life cycle. Um, most cannabis production does revolve around mother plants in that um, females carry all of the weight of propagation and success in cannabis. Um, males are required for propagation and new seed uh, manufacture or new strain manufacture. But as I mentioned, most people are familiar that if a female flower part has seeds in it, um, it's a lower quality um, product uh, to be sold and consumed otherwise. So it's common that we use established genetic female mothers of known cultivars, something like our Durban mother. Again, that plant could be 30, 40, 50 years old um, coming from California and, and now here to Illinois and, and onward out to other markets. And so the idea being that we want a consistent product that uh, cloning tips from a mother plant, we know that she'll be female, we know her cannabinoid profiles, I know her growing preferences. Um, and then you start to layer in what you would consider typical horticultural production. I would do clones from a poinsettia plant, a mum, anything else that I wanted to have a baby plant that was just like its adult. But you can see I've noted there that obviously a, a large layer of regulation is put in place that every individual that's collected, even this little baby um, before it was even rooted, you can see it has its barcode tracking. And in Illinois, for example, we have weekly audits from the Department of Agriculture uh, ensuring that a plant uh, at all times is exactly where I have it listed in our state tracking system. They have access to that. Um, so it really is, it's, it's more regulation than you would see in an opiate manufacturer. It's more security than you would see in a casino with respect to cameras and footage, um, security guards. So what we can say is that yes, definitely the uh, certainly modern iterations of security and traceability are onerous and expensive. If it gives the public and likewise, yeah, certainly people who are, are not uh, big fans of cannabis comfort in what we're doing, uh, then so be it. Uh, we're, we're comfortable with working through those challenges, but they definitely are evident. Um, we can move to the next slide there. So after uh, essentially uh, a small immature plant, we now move into a vegetative state. Typically a clone would be transplanted into a soil, soilless media, media hydroponics. Um, there's definitely different ways to grow and produce the plant, all with differing pros and cons. You can notice the perpetual harvest that I have here demonstrated in this space so that I have uh, in the center tray, uh, very immature plants on the trays to the right, um, uh, a next level older, and then the trays to the left, 
a next level over. And again, you want that perpetual motion because one, it provides a, a consistent supply of harvesting flour when these plants mature. It's also a level load state for all of my processing, marketing, manufacturing, everything that I'm gonna do in a facility perspective. It makes sense to have a consistent wheel of uh, production to be able to, to maintain that consistency all the way through the manufacturing chain. Um, let's go ahead and advance the animation there, please. Ah, so once those plants have vegetated um, to a, a choice, you could, you could bring a clone into flower if you wanted to, but commonly that they're going to go through a vegetative cycle and then they're going to move to a, a bloom space. And the difference here is a light duration. So cannabis as a light determinate plant, uh, it will just grow vegetatively with no flowering parts if it gets more than 12 to 14 hours of light. As soon as it drops to 12 hours of light, 12 hours of darkness, so think of the equinox here in North America, it's going to start its sexual reproduction cycle. And what you can see in this picture is that the female flowering parts are just becoming evident, the small flowers with the white pistils, the white hairs. Again, no males in this space because one male would pollinate all of these beautiful females and, and definitely reduce their quality from a... Uh, um, uh, please advance the, the animation there. And so during this bloom cycle, it's gonna be a 60 to 70 day cycle. So from the time that that vegetative plant goes into uh, a bloom space, another two months later, it's going to have these nice big healthy flowers. Uh, obviously most of you are familiar with what uh, finished cannabis flower looks like, certainly trichome laden. They've developed the cannabinoids, the terpenes associated with the flower itself. And so uh, from this point, from the time that I cut that clone, um, under normal cycles, it's anywhere between three and four months to get this particular plant to this stage and ready to be sold, sold as flower. And so by extension, that also behooves the ability to have a perpetual harvest, that I don't want to wait three, four months every time I grow a crop, harvest it, um, if I'm in an indoor high intensity style production or even a greenhouse. So let's move on to see what we can do with this plant now that we've grown it to maturity. So next slide, please. Uh, so we move on to harvest. So it's a little bit tricky, but what you can see are two, oh yeah, sorry, back up one, please. Thank you so much. Um, so harvest, you can see we have the plants hanging upside down with those gentlemen on the left. Uh, we have to weigh each individual plant and enter it into the state traceability system. So the state wants to know every part of that plant, even the stalk and stem that I'm not gonna use, the bigger vegetative leaves are relatively low in cannabinoids. We have to weigh it, we have to report every individual one. So obviously a huge bottleneck in production and a challenge uh, to be able to, to report the data that the state needs for us to maintain compliance. Two avenues that we can do with that flower, I can take it through the top avenue of drying and curing. We will sort, trim that flower, sell it as raw usable flower, a free roll if the market allows. Um, or we could take that fresh flower, a common uh, outcome is something like a fresh frozen extraction product. You can vacuum seal that fresh flower, um, throw it in the freezer, at that point, it's no longer usable for smokable flour. If you try to thaw it out, it's, it's not gonna be very um, palatable. However, when you lock in all those essential oils and turn it into a concentrate, um, that's known as the, a live resin style product. You might've heard of liquid, liquid live resin that really is taking high quality flour, shoving it in the freezer, and then we'll take it through the extraction process um, here momentarily. So next slide, please. Um, quick note on drying and curing. So this is a typical drying and curing. Once that flower is wet, we do need to get the moisture out of it. And I also don't want to do it so quickly that it volatizes all of those terpenes and smell molecules, flavor molecules, because one, that's definitely the quality bag appeal associated with that flower. And two, those terpenes also contribute to the uh, impact upon consumption. So in general, that slow dry and cure maintains quality. You certainly have operators, I saw them in Denver, that would take this wet flour, throw it on a cookie sheet, five days later it's dried and tested, uh, 10 days later it's gone through zero cure and it's being sold as a recreational product, would have very little smell or flavor, but would still have an experience associated with it and would, would gain revenue for a recreational style company. Obviously lab analysis is a huge um, improvement over the early medical days, um, being able to certify that this flour, one, uh, what its potency is, two, that it has no visual contaminant, three, that um, it will do heavy metal analysis, uh, for pesticide residues, which are, are we're in the most strict um, regulatory environment for pesticide residues. In other words, non-detect um, in Illinois, Pennsylvania, all of these modern medical markets, you cannot apply pesticides on uh, a blooming plant. Um, and that ultimately you're gonna certify every batch to be non-detect for pesticides. And then they're gonna do a microbial plating um, or PCR analysis to make sure that while this flower may look perfectly fine from a visual assessment, if it has excessive loads of microbial counts, yeast and mold, total aerobic bacteria, 
that if someone's inhaling that, especially to a compromised immune system, um, that flower uh, might ultimately be deleterious to their health. Um, so markets that weren't testing for something like a microbial load um, are having challenges essentially now testing for it because the flower may look perfectly fine and would have sold easily on the black market, but ultimately fails then um, uh, when you try to sell it as a certified flower product. So next slide, please. Uh, yeah, quick question. No, there are no genetically modified uh, commercial-based cannabis strains right now. I know some people um, are working on CRISPRs in their own basements, but uh, no, certainly non-GMO for Cres Cresco. So, uh, sorry, and I'll try not to answer too many questions in the chat there, but that was definitely a good one. Um, so now on to packaging and distribution. What you guys can see here is a legacy order. Um, for most markets, the product must leave in a child-resistant, tamper-proof packaging. That makes the dispensaries more often just like a liquor store that will put that product uh, on a shelf. Uh, we'll sell it because we took the we took the initiative to package it, distribute it. Um, and again, this is uh, big areas for improvements uh, because it's such a, a new industry that a consumer packaged goods approach. If you think of how PepsiCo bottles all their Pepsi and ships it all everywhere across the country, that's where cannabis is going. But right now, that. Uh, that's not how it can work. I can't send anything that I manufacture in Illinois outside of Illinois state lines. So we really have bumped up into a lot of these economies of scale um, that ultimately I think there's a big area for, for innovation in these spaces. And, and I'm excited for, for you all considering the industry uh, for where it is now currently, but obviously where it's going. It's, it's going to be a, a huge manifestation of all these different avenues of, um, of normalization compared to a Pepsi company or a Coors, Molson Coors, something like that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so extraction, let's take a minute. If I'm not going to use that uh, flour, we can turn it into an extraction based product. As I mentioned, the fresh frozen flour that went straight to the freezer, I'll extract that into a liquid, uh, a live style product. Dry flour can also be turned into a, an essential oil concentrate. Um, we use uh, solvents to do so, either butane, ethanol, carbon dioxide, water as a solvent can also be used. Um, it's essentially forced through a column of water. We extract those essential oils in the same way that you would lavender oil or rose oil or any other essential oil coming from a plant-based um, source. And then we have to, especially with butane and ethanol, remove those residual solvents to a certain threshold before we can sell that. Um, residual solvent lift limits do vary by market. I believe you can sell a residual solvent uh, below 5,000 PP part per million in Denver right now, which to me seems painfully high. Illinois and Pennsylvania were always a 10 part per million residual threshold. And for those who are aware that if I'm measuring the amount of butane or ethanol left in any of these products, 10 part per million is generally the detection limit of the machine I'm using to measure that solvent. So we're very comfortable here in Illinois specifically that if I'm selling and certifying this product as an extraction of either butane or ethanol, there's none of that solvent left behind. And I hope that other markets begin to put in those stricter limits in there. It's, it's harder to be able to manufacture with those lower limits, but obviously it's, it's more healthy for a consumer, especially a, a residual consumer or a frequent consumer. Let's move to the next slide, please. Um, at that point, then, you have an essential oil. Um, you can do all sorts of recreational or pharmaceutical style products. Obviously, e-cigarettes were, were big in the news late 2019. Um, thankfully, the black market um, stigmas associated with those deaths um, really gave us a, an opportunity to talk about how we certify our e-cigarettes as solely cannabis oil, none of the excipients, none of the things that were, were proving deleterious to people's health. Um, and then, uh, you know, moreover, um, you've got things like a... a gel cap tinctures, uh, there will be cannabis suppositories one of these days for all the registered nurses. Um, and, and so that's an exciting front. Um, let's uh, move to the next slide there. Uh, moving on and finishing up with edibles. So we have, uh, and you could take plant parts and put them in an edible if you want to, but more often it is common to be able to take that oil, refine it down, remove some of the flavor components so that you can have an active THC based dosing ingredient, an oil that you can then put into any type of uh, edible. Um, so ultimately, uh, you know, this is a common uh, market iteration where it's allowed. We can do edibles in Illinois that have to be stable at room temperature, but these will continue to increase in market share uh, because new entrants to the cannabis space, you know, certainly legacy flower and, and concentrate consumers like myself, I tend to avoid the calories associated with uh, edibles just to uh, avoid my dad bod liability. But um, for people who aren't familiar with cannabis, this is going to be the mechanism for which um, they first become comfortable with microdosing small amounts of THC. Um, obviously, they, they need to taste good, be relatively palatable, and the biggest thing is consistent, that if someone's eating one piece one day, 
you know, there's going to be some variability with what their metabolism or their uh, diet might do for how it, it makes them feel, but it needs to be consistent for them as a consumer. If they break that piece in half, both pieces need to be consistent. Um, and so ultimately, edibles have been a, a good product for us to be able to, to bring cannabis to a new demographic of consumer who certainly wouldn't be cons uh, comfortable either inhaling a joint or um, uh, an e-cigarette or something like that. Next slide, please. So let's just wrap this up with a little bit of consideration what we kind of take, uh, we took a look at from a high level perspective and uh, Kinshasa phrased it well with interdisciplinary work. So you can see in, in to get to these final product stages, you go through a horticultural production. You're then going to have to uh, flower, harvest that product, process it, certify it from a lab perspective, um, package it, distribute it. Um, you may take it through a biochemical lab extraction and analysis. Uh, as we said, then finish with the edibles kitchen. Um, we have a heavy operations component, obviously distribution, revenue planning when it comes to being able to model a company and, and see where you're going with respect to, to having operational success. And then our entire corporate uh, branch, essentially branding, marketing, legal, accounting, human resources, investor relations. Um, what I hope to kind of paint with this uh, quick discussion was how there's so many avenues of um, contribution from different disciplines within this one singular model we took at, which is active in, in Illinois. Um, outside of that, you know, something like the, the most recent iterations of um, public relations, of community integration, um, you know, these are relatively new and novel um, investment structures for a corporation, unfortunately. Um, and what I can say is that, you know, for those of us who certainly started paying attention to the cannabis industry in the last five to seven years of I, as I have, we should have been better about anticipating that this uh, industry maturation is going to be subject to the same liabilities that we face in America today, which is exclusion for uh, minority communities. Um, and, and ultimately, now to see corporate structures such as Cresco and other operators as well, now put substantial corporate revenues tied back into uh, social equity initiatives, um, that's what really keeps, uh, you know, my passion alive. Um, I certainly have, have uh, lamented that, you know, the revenue grind of, of corporate cannabis um, is less ideal, that uh, hopefully through these types of conversations, we can empower you all to find an avenue in cannabis that speaks to your passion, that begins to make this cannabis industry look like um, the rest of the population with respect to um, a wealth of diversity and opinions and viewpoints that really make companies like mine, any future com uh, companies, much stronger uh, and much more uh, able to be uh, able to evolve in, in a responsible manner. Um, so I think that pretty well caps the discussion. I had some references and a thank you slide there, but um, yeah, I've, I've definitely got time for questions. I, I hope, uh, you know, if we've been able to take some or whatever the preferred venue is, um, yeah, thank you for your time today. I certainly appreciate it. We'll get your questions in the Q&A section. Um, Keith and I are going to kind of take it back to before there was you, you know, before there was you, there were different federal laws um, that um, prohibited um, the sale, the use of cannabis. Um, after that, um, there were predatory laws that um, impacted African-Americans such as myself. And I'm kind of the opposite of you. I started, I got into this industry, my um, business partner um, has friends in Humboldt. So I started using their trash, using my environmental background, taking the trash, turning it into bath salts, bath bombs, that pan cream, all the different things that I could think of making that I already made, you know, without cannabis. And so um, I started looking in the news and looking around my community here in Berkeley, and I noticed that everyone was a white male, you know, that was engaged. And then I started seeing that these predominantly white institutions had funding and they had um, alumni that were capable of helping them to establish these programs. And so I shifted my focus less on you know establishing my vertical business license in cannabis to doing some equity work and so um tangy and mary i know that you all have a lot of um, history doing um, work with equity so if you could tell me mary how did you get to doing what you do um in cannabis i know that you had a great experience in marketing and you had a, a wonderful career there but how did you transition from one career into cannabis uh, I mean, I come from like music media and like uh, advertising and tech, like you said. Um, for me, um, I got more involved in it from a understanding um, the science of the plant and the things that are part of the over 20, well, over 100 um, cannabinoids that make up the plant um, when I pretty much almost died twice from um, developing Crohn's in 2012. Um, I was in, I've been in hospital over 40 times since then. 
with flares, um, most of it being during uh, 2012, 2013, and 2014, because of things that I was getting um, to treat it for with Western medicine was not working. And so it took a lot of trial and error um, in 2015, where I started just like taking kind of like more things into my own hands. I was flying to different states to get medical cards, um, to get access to cannabis. At the time, also, I was training to be a death doula, um, mostly to help my mother transition due to her complications from lupus and MS. And the only thing that allowed her to not have pain for the last two weeks of her physical existence here with us was cannabis. Um, fentanyl patches weren't working. Dilaudid drip wasn't working. Liquid morphine wasn't working. Um, and I was someone that had been through Dilaudid drips and morphine in terms of pain relief and situations like that for Crohn's and I was miserable. I was unable to work, um, but it was through like having more direct connections with being able to get like Rick, Rick, Rick Simpson oil and like concentrate CBC format, um, CBDA format, um, CBG formats, um, taking different ingestion methods. Like I was doing Rick Simpson oil through suppositories and through my belly button, like stuff like that. Like I got very more so into what I need to do to treat myself. Um, and so now I'm on one medication and most of my regiment is situated in cannabis. So when I realized that I need to have more access to the medicine that this plant really is, I moved to California um, and realized that the game had been pretty much sold and wasn't being told in terms of how black and brown folks were not really in the room. I would be one of three black folks at an event. I would be one black woman in a room with all white men in meetings. Like it was just, a little bit of a shell shock being someone that comes from New York um, that's from Detroit originally that you know grew up in black cities had pretty much really diverse environments um, you know being at tea parties where people asked me how did I get there and what did I how did I know about cannabis and they were not anywhere near close to melanated was a big culture shock and so Canacusa was born in 2017 out of that with two other black women um, in my circle. Um, we're now a team of eight. And, you know, honestly, if it wasn't for my Crohn's, I wouldn't have become more of the advocate that I am for this, um, which requires me to do a lot of things that deal with the ways that our people have kind of like been oppressed by the use of certain terminology um, the creation and not really having full understanding as to words that we use when we describe, you know, things such as the legacy market and things that we describe, such as like, you know, cannabis versus like the racial nature of how marijuana came about as a way to like target black and brown people um, as part of a whole entire war against us on top of a textile war. Like, there's a lot that we don't know, but we do know that, you know, drugs have been taught to us to be um, harmful. Um, we also know that drugs have been put into our communities um, to destroy black wealth um, by government bodies. And this is not conspiracy talking, it's facts. So, you know, given my history with growing up with a family that grew the plant in the backyard, grew the plant on the farm in Alabama back when it was allowed, when hemp was a thing, um, it's just, I've always had a green thumb for knowing that, you know, grandma is growing this in the backyard in Detroit and not to touch it. But I always knew that like, it was part of like her regiment for herself too and for my mother. Um, so a lot of that just kind of came to a headway. Um, my work is now 60 to 65 to 70% cannabis. I still do a lot of media work for clients um, and a lot of inclusion strategy for clients as well. Um, and a lot of like web development for clients as well. But you know, I think that if it wasn't for me unfortunately damn near dying and um the loss of my mother in terms of my journey is becoming a death doula and serving people that need to transition in peace for about two years after that um i wouldn't be this hardcore in it from an advocacy level and from a talking about it that we need to use it and understand why we've been trained and propagandized um if you will in terms of this plant to keep us away from it while people are now starting to make a lot of money off of it, um, I, I wouldn't, it, it would mostly be due to the fact that Crohn's kind of brought me to this point. 
Um, and so we do work with MSOs. We do work with cannabis and hemp companies on figuring out what they need to do to be more equitable in the space. Um, I've done marketing work and judge work um, for incubators. I've been happy to help my homies get ways in and checks in through like ease accelerator and things like that. Um, so, you know, whether it's through helping MSOs better ways to be more equitable um, while we're living in this time, you know, the, the inequalities of cannabis are so ridiculous and harmful because while we've been fighting for equal rights as black and brown people, especially as black folks, white people um, have been very, very forceful in building their own equity. So now we're trying to catch up to what they have. Um, and, you know, the, it, it's a very, very, very big challenge that we all need to take seriously. Um, and while advocacy and education is critical, it's a matter of everybody doing both. Um, because just waiting at this point in time is something that greatly concerns me given um, how we're not able to shape our full futures in other industries because of this imbalance. Um, but, you know, that's why I'm here. And I think that, you know, you can find a way to create an equitable industry as a large corporation, as a small business owner. Um, I think that all these things are duly and 100% needed and possible. Um, but I think we have to take it seriously and move fast as well. Okay, thank you. And Tangi, I know that you're in the South and I call myself like a California peach. Um, I attended college in Atlanta, Clark Atlanta University, um, raised my kids there for a little while. And so I, I've always had the understanding that my liberal perspective and I guess you could say mode of operation isn't conducive to me doing, um, it doesn't work for me to do some of the social equity work. And so just with your experience hearing Mary um, understanding um, about cannabis, uh, the decriminalization aspect of it, um, the medicinal popping up, recreational, what would you say is your greatest challenge in moving the electorate and moving the communities in the South towards a more liberal, I guess you could say perspective, like a state like California where we have medicinal and recreational, even like Illinois, like what would you say is the biggest hindrance for you? That's a great question. And I think it's a combination of all of it. Like Mary said, the fact that we lack education, the fact that we are just not equipped with the community aspect of joining together with our funds, joining together with our resources and combining those things together and then amplifying that. And then on a national, international scale, being able to compete in this industry has been a very big challenge for um, us, especially in the South, because I understand the ramifications of the drug war in the South. I kind of have some leniency. We really were targeted. We really were, uh, demonized and decriminalized. I mean, we were really put in jail for this. Our families were interrupted generationally. So you have on the West Coast, third and fourth generation growers of cannabis, but on the East Coast or in the South or wherever in the Black community, you have third and fourth generation of families destroyed by the war on drugs being in jail. So you have the great grandfather, the father, all of these people are in jail for cannabis or for you know, drugs, it led to other opportunities that were detrimental to the family as well. And so being involved in Georgia has been frustrating. I'm gonna be real honest with you. It's been very, um, it's been a situation where I know my legacy is here, my family's here. I know I came back for a reason, but every day I question why I'm putting up with this. And that's just to be honest, it's just like, I, I don't have to deal with this. I'm knowledgeable. I can go back to the West Coast. I can be perfectly fine and do my business out there. But that's not, it's not, that's not conducive to me being happy and being around people that look like me. I don't want that. Like it's, it's reach one, teach one, honestly. And once I know something, I have to be that person that, goes out and tells other people because if not education it should be free honestly and that's full circle to what we're talking about in this whole situation everything that we have experienced as a community between red zoning and housing our food deserts our education or lack thereof our business loan that we don't get ever from the bank or, you know, opportunities are just not given to us. And so all of that has put us in this situation. And I think we need to hyper-focus on cannabis. This is a situation where we cannot like be lackadaisical about it because 
cannabis is, I believe, the center point of everything. Because you have a cannabis conviction, you can't get student loans or housing or you can't, you know, get a bank loan or you can't vote or you can't, like all of those things are tied in for a reason and it's by design. It's also a reason and by design that the West Coast is as free and liberal to do what they want and other places that are heavily uh, minority based have to be regulated so heavily and have to have this type of millions of dollars in the bank, or you have to have, you know, these credentials, or you have to have had this business opened up for 30 years, or you're a farmer for 30. All of this is by design. And I think we're in a very unique position right now where shit is hitting the fan and we should take advantage of it. We should absolutely continue to riot and stop everything until we have an equitable stake in this industry. And an equitable stake means, okay, not only are we doing home grows, we're also doing, um, because it's medicine and it's essential medicine now, and because it's essential business, everyone should have that business opportunity. So we're not allowing anyone else to get a license. We're not allowing anyone else to put their dollars into any other state until we have have black people accounted for and made sure that they have a license before anyone else. We'll figure out how to get the growth started. We'll figure out how to get the commercial property and the land and all that stuff until we get a license and until we're in a position of ownership, we will continue to be devastated by this will be a new um, war on drugs if we don't. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting that you say that um, some of the things we were supposed to kind of go into more in depth is just like identifying some of the legislation that has passed. And so recently, you know, hemp has become legal. And I had a conversation with a friend from the South and I invited him to be on the show. And he said, I don't do marijuana. He said, I don't do cannabis. I do hemp. And so like that misinformation, you know, I kept saying to him, I said, well, cannabis is hemp and marijuana. But he was afraid to have that connection because there's a lack of knowledge, I guess you could say, in the business world, obviously in the community. That's why we're engaging folks now. Would you, what would you say, or this is for both of you guys, Mary and Tangi, which um, piece of legislation do you believe has had the greatest impact on us taking steps, um, not only as African Americans, um, but just as, as connoisseurs of cannabis, um, interested entrepreneurs, you know, like I, I noticed a boost in my blackness um, being of concern when George Floyd died. So it's like now we have all these folks that are interested and they want to know and they want to help. What piece of legislation do you believe has the greatest, has had the greatest impact on African Americans engaging? I'd love to start and I'm sure Tangi will have the same answer. None. Yeah. No. So the answer is zero. Um, and the, the bigger Thing that I'm, I'm seeing that I know Tangi and Tangi will say the same thing. Um, Tangi saves her lives and put them up. I don't. I be going off on my lives and I just delete them because I be just keeping it a little too honest on my personal page. But um, <laughs> you know, I'm really concerned with how we, as people, and this is not a black or white thing. This is a analyzing the facts through the visuals. Visually, you would think that black people are being heard. Fact-wise, that's not true. Nothing that's happened so far has resulted in different policies to modify how police are really treated outside of a few million dollars being removed here and there from cities that were already going to do that and the removal of qualified immunity in Colorado. Outside of that, that's it. And still within Aurora, Colorado, the people that killed Elijah McCain have not been charged formally with anything. Nope. In Louisville, Kentucky, with the Republican Black Attorney General, these people have not been charged with killing um, Breonna Taylor. So even with those two items and legislation in regards to cannabis, um, there are social equity programs that are being defunded because more money is being sent over to the police. That's happened in Massachusetts. It's happened in LA County. Yep. There are programs that are in Oakland that or taking advantage of people that don't know how to read an MSA or an, or an OA. Um, there, and those are called operating agreements in case people do not know. Um, so I, I honestly think that we have completely missed what's happening on the fact level 
versus all of the fairy tales of celebrities having licensing deals and not really having ownership. So there's a big difference between that that we miss in understanding that because we're thinking that, okay, if Snoop, has, if Snoop owns something in cannabis, no, he has licensing deals and it's his face and likeness being used, not an ownership item. So for every celebrity that we see getting a brand, that's a licensing deal. That's not ownership. There is still less than 4% black ownership in cannabis. So, you know, there's a lot of that that we are not aware of from a businessing as business aspect that's changing or not allowing Tangi and I to get the message across because like it's like Tangi, I could I could have stayed in Cali. I don't need to be worrying about Detroit and worrying about New York. I really could have just stayed in Cali. But because of my civil rights history with my grandmother, um, I I felt compelled to try. But Tangi and I are being very honest when we say like, I feel like our community is missing the boat. And this pandemic, for all the horrible things it has shown us, it has also given us a little bit of more time. So I'll let Tangi continue on that, um, that, and I'm sure Tangi has more to say to that point as well. Thank you, Mary. Tangi, please. Yes, I. you know what? This pandemic, I said this the other day, I was like, this pandemic low-key was a blessing, honestly. And not a blessing, like, in a good thing, meaning, like, we were so far behind. We were so lost when it came to legislation, when it came to them just, like, literally taking over the industry all over again, that we weren't even in a position, none of the people, none of the people that were advocating were in a position to make any changes um, because we were so, we were trying to do it in California, we were trying to do it in Georgia, we were trying to do it in different places, and that's still the same. But now, all eyes are hyper focused on, like, okay, but like now we're starting to un unravel some things. Now we're starting to like take some things apart, and like, oh, this really doesn't make any sense. White people are diabolical sometimes, like, some, <laughs> you know, like, we really got to start being open and honest about these conversations. And one thing that we don't know is that Fed Trump state, and I think that's what we really need to harp on right now. Federally, if we just start with hemp, if we took over hemp, we would be A1. I think that hemp is going to far surpass marijuana. And if we just get in on the ground floor of hemp right now with all of its 100,000 uses, with its medical properties, with it being able to literally interrupt every industry or business that you know of, hemp has that potential. And so that is what we need to focus our attention on. But we can't because people are still getting arrested for seeds, for seeds seeds that I could get at a party in California, seeds that I could get, you know, mailed to me from Amsterdam somewhere. Like people are still getting arrested for that in the South. And because hemp is legal now, legal now because of the federal 2018 farm bill, we should definitely take advantage of that. The problem with that is, is that officers no longer know the difference between hemp and marijuana. So they still arrest you. They still confiscate your stuff. They still, you know, ruin your life and give you a record or you lose everything because they want to wait and let it rot and dry rot. And now you've lost your investment and they don't arrest you, but you've lost everything else and they might as well have. So it's just a game that we're playing. So again, everything has to be focused on at the exact same time, which is extremely unfortunate because it's just like Tangi, we got the prison industrial complex, we got food deserts, we got voter suppression, we got, I know, I get it, but all of it has to be focused on and we have to figure out a way to do it collectively because the 2018 Farm Bill says that hemp is legal federally, period. That's the end of that discussion. So because we know that, we need to find a way to protect ourselves around that, using that bubble, and we haven't been able to do that yet. And with the social equity programs those are all a joke i haven't seen one that has worked out in the favor of people of melanated people at all even in illinois even in pennsylvania even in you know all of these states that try they're still missing the fact that there are predatory vultures running around taking up these licenses from black people and paying them pennies on the dollar when they're getting hundreds of thousands, if not millions on the back end, because people don't know how to negotiate operating agreements. They don't know how to negotiate their worth when it comes to setting up a business. Like, no, I'm the, I'm the equity owner here. I should get majority stake. And when majority stake should be 70, 30, 80, 20 split, people are getting pennies. And it's actually very, very sad 
situation and there's no protection for them. There's no protection for our legacy market people to come into the, to the legal market. There's no protection or leeway or pathway for them to do that. We have to create that for them. So we have to actually create what we want to see and we actually have to create the legislation. Like I'm talking about sit down and type it up ourselves because that's the only way. There's no advantage for them. There's no incentive for them to make this equitable or fair, even in the midst of this racial tension that we have right now. Licenses are still being given out. Equity is still being, um, you know, attained by white owners. People are still negotiating deals. Mergers and acquisitions are still happening. And yet we're having conversations about the history. It's not the same. We're not having the same conversations. And that too is also putting us behind because we're trying to keep and get everybody up to speed when people are taking off. Like people are importing and exporting right now. This is ludicrous that we're having conversations about, you know, the sativa strain or the indica strain or something. And it needs to happen. I completely understand that. But again, we're, we're now on totally different conversations. And I think that's what's preventing us from moving ahead. So I want to, and I also want to add, you know, while we're worrying about what's happening in North America, there are a lot of us that got family roots somewhere else, whether it's back in the continent of Africa, whether it's in the Caribbean. And my conversation, I wake up at five in the morning for the past two months because I'm having conversations in the UK, Ghana, and Zimbabwe, and South Africa. Like, you know, we, we're, we're still talking about gelato, and the industry is talking about how they're gonna take over all of the industry in Ghana and divvy it up. And Ghanaians are looking at us like, well, there are no black people in the game. We can't talk to anybody. It, it, it's, it's really, really bigger than just doing one-on-ones and talking about the history of the plant. You know, I want to be able to tell you to do two things given the time we have. I want you to read this and I want you to read this and then let's have a conversation about the next step. This is on your own. This is your homework. This is How to Succeed in the Cannabis Industry, the third edition from Nishita Dawson. Here's Cannabis Pharmacy. If you want to read about the Leafly Guide to Cannabis, you can go get that. Like, Go get these books and get that popping. But Tangie and I want to talk about business. Tangie and I want to be like, can we put together a B Corp and put our money together and get land in, in Georgia? Like the, that's the conversation we want to have. We, Tangie and I definitely are kind of like, hey, we told y'all to get these books and to read this three years ago, four years ago. We need to be doing this and talking about the future. And, and that's the thing that concerns me the most. And also to add this, dispensaries take a lot of work and not everybody needs to own a dispensary. Thinking about that, it's not like the Gap, it's not like you own a party store. A dispensary takes a lot of work. Most dispensaries are not making money. They're operating in the red and they're able to do that through private funding because you can't use a bank right now to get that. You can't get a grant. So a lot of this is private investment. A lot of it is private money. A lot of it might not get a return. A lot of it might end up getting robbed during an, a social action, but you gotta be ready to take that L, right? So, you know, for everyone that thinks like, yo, I worked at The Gap, I can get a dispensary. It's not that simple. Like you really need to understand the science, the money and the lobbying and the connections that you need to establish in this space. So you know, we need to get a little bit more aware of how people are, are doing this and creating partnerships with HBCUs and getting HBCUs to create partnership with us and coming to the table with a plan because that whole Southern University thing came together as a plan. FAMU, I still don't know what's circulated all the way with that, with the agricultural program, but you know, if we're trying to really have HBCUs figure out sustainability plans on top of making sure that people don't drop out because they can't afford to go to school next year. This is the money game. This is the plan. And we're too, we're too busy trying to educate legislators who keep calling cannabis marijuana, not knowing that's not what you're supposed to be doing and educating senators who think that we're doing a lot of catching up and it's holding us back. Catching up is holding us back completely. Well, I would say, you know, um, our initiative is definitely a holistic solution. 
um, we believe to getting African Americans involved. Our cannabis partners, for example, Cresco, um, I have a very good understanding of how they operate. I also have an understanding of what people, you know, say um, from the grassroots kind of perspective. But I think the unique thing about what we're all doing here in this entire series is we are giving everyone different tidbits. I'm not sure if you guys saw, you, Mary or Tangie, if you guys saw some of the other topics, but we will go into HBCU on the horizon. When you were specifically talking about Southern, um, my business partner's grandma, um, aunt and his father started the agricultural department. And like you said, you know, some of these things have happened, but there's also, um, there's not enough. So Southern has someone there cultivating and manufacturing, but there's no educational programs. And with some of our partners like Cresco, True Leave and Kaliva, they are interested in coming in to bring those things. Um, if any of you all attended an HBCU, you know we're not just saying, hey, non-black person walk on our campus and tell us something good because we don't have to. We have enough of our own to do that. And so our goal with this initiative is to offer a variety of information that not only prepares the next generation, but it also prepares voters so that they can understand. And Keith and I have written legislation for Georgia. So we understand how important it is to have some of those reports for those politicians because it's not just advocates that are doing it. It's individuals that advocates touch and individuals that advocates influence so that they can go to the pollings and they can vote in favor of the things that we're talking about. And um, I would just like to say, um, or I'll just ask, are, can you, Tangie and Mary, may you give me three things that you believe that someone on this call or um, anyone seeking to enter into the cannabis space, whether it's as an advocate, as an entrepreneur, you know, as a professor, as a STEM professor, um, we will have our next show is Cannabis is STEM. So we'll kind of go into that more. Our goal is to provide as much information as we can to historically black college students, obviously to African Americans, so that we can empower our community because we recognize that, um, you know, and Jason and I, you know, we've been talking and we're working with, with Morehouse. So we all get it. Um, one of the things that I, Notice when I entered into this space was that I'm I'm kind of not like a grassroots person, but I'm not really a corporate person, and I've always seen myself as um, someone that can unite those two. And I hope that after today, you know, we can all start talking to these cannabis cannabis companies and expressing, you know, what it is that we feel and asking them to do what we need because that's what I did. This is what I need. This is what you can do, and let's move forward because it does work. Yeah, and I mean, that's what we've done with the accountability list. But again, like that came out of the fact that like it just seemed appropriate for people to know who's supporting the fight for black lives and who's sticking to their ideas of donations. And also letting people know that donating to an organization that does nothing for cannabis and that is actually taking money from the Koch brothers to make sure that they don't talk about cannabis isn't the best way to go, right? And it also is important to highlight the people like Tangie that are black, that have their own companies that should be part of this economic circulation since now people wanna buy black, although I think I've been buying black since I've been black, which is 38 years. So, you know, I, I just kind of like think that, you know, we really have to be very mindful and intentional these companies are now seemingly ready to listen, like Kentasha saying, like, that's true, but you gotta have a plan. But again, I want everyone to grab their books and do, do both. Like yeah. read, figure it, start an ancillary business, look up the difference between plant touching and ancillary. If you really wanna pull your money together, figure out a way to do that as financially safe as possible. Please know that everything is a risk, like there's no guarantees in this life, but that's the conversation I'm ready to have. And the three things people need to do is one, educate yourself, educate the people around you that you want to be part of this and think about the lane. And there are black businesses that you can invest in. You can go to Inclusive Base. If you find five and you email me, I'll tell you which ones are actually available. If you wanna find out how to support Tangie and go to her Squarespace, which was posted in the chat and do that, you can. If, they, if you wanna figure out what is happening with HBCU Can Equity Initiative, fine, but we're doing all this visual showcasing and I'm not seeing results and I'm not seeing direct contact being made with all of these amazing people, including yourself, to make these ideas happen. 
I'm just being very, very direct and trying to be honest while also loving and concerning at the same time for the future that we need to have for ourselves in this space. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate you. And Tandy, what do you have to add to that? I I think we we do need to do a couple of things. I think that we have to have a different conversation of pre-corona versus post-corona when it comes to the cannabis industry and pre-corona was, you know, us just trying to get in where we fit in. Honestly, that's where we were. We were just finding out about it. We were just getting, you know, our legs under us. We were trying to figure out how to set up a booth and all that stuff. Now, after that, post-corona is totally different. And pre-corona, you were able to go to your supervisor board meetings. You were able to go to your tax meetings, your zoning committee meetings, your town hall meetings. Those were the places that things happen. Things take place at local level when it comes to cannabis. And, um, those were the places that you could meet your council members and you could talk to them and let them know that you're a business owner and that you're interested in making sure that this industry was equitable and they would listen to you or they or they wouldn't it just depends on where you were so in georgia they don't listen because we didn't show up in numbers like we did in california in california we would show up 200 300 400 deep in Georgia, you might get 30, 40 people. That's not enough to move anything. So you have to be involved. You have to be an advocate if you're in this industry. And I know people who don't consume, but who are a part of this industry, but they still advocate. They still let people know in a minute if they say, some, if they say something wrong about cannabis or if they're misinformed or if they you know, are saying anything racial, anything, they correct them on the spot. That's what we need. We need those type of allies because that's how it's going to spread. If everyone came out the cannabis closet today, we would be done. We wouldn't even be on this conference call because there's no reason for us to continue talking about it. So that's the first thing, um, having different conversations because post-corona, we're essential business and we're essential medicine now. So our conversation is of authority. Our conversation is like, we're going in there, oh no, listen, no, we're essential business. We absolutely need a license. We're gonna get every, every license that you offer to anyone else, there's a, there's a license for a black person as well. Half your licenses will go to black people and then we're going to create a zoning situation where you know we can be out on our own. I really feel like it's time for us to just separate and us to figure out how we can focus on our community alone. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. We haven't been for 400 years. We have not been allowed to focus solely on our community. And this opportunity will not happen again for another 200 years. Uh, industry reinventing itself, coming out of nowhere, where we can start on the ground floor. This won't happen again for a while, especially not in our generation. So it's imperative that we take the conversation of post-corona as we're essential business and we're essential medicine. And so if we're essential medicine, everyone should have access to it because it doesn't matter what the condition is, it's essential medicine. And then um, for essential business, African-Americans have to be involved in it, period. And we're not allowing any other states to legalize because we only got 17 left, y'all. We, we don't have that many states left that haven't legalized or have some form of cannabis on the books. So we absolutely have to get involved now. Second thing is, is making sure that you understand where the industry is pivoting. Dispensary, listen, I'm not about to play with y'all. We're not opening up any more dispensaries, okay? Like we're not even having conversations about dispensaries because e-commerce is the future, okay? 200 transactions a minute in Canada, let me know that we're not going to have brick and mortars the way we used to. Also, COVID changed everything. People are not going to be a, want to be around or coming in. You're not allowed. To, I ain't been out to eat okay and forever so <laughs> things are going to be how they're going to be so this new industry that we're looking at we're looking at data analytics we're looking at software development we're looking at tech we're looking at these industries that can far surpass and create the skills that we need to stay in this industry for the long term not just you know for a couple of years we don't want that and really the third thing is like figuring out your niche you know what do you do now don't be trying to grow because you ain't grew nothing before don't do that try to be an hr person try to be an accountant try to be a tax professional try to do the things that you know how to do right now in this industry because it's needed we need you so bad and we need you right now and we need people that that look like us that we can trust don't come in here being a vulture or trying to do astronomic prices and all that stuff be come come in here helpful and humble and we can we got you you're on mute my love Sorry, I'm just talking. 
Um, I was just saying thank you to you, um, Tangi, and to Mary for coming here and keeping it real and keeping it raw. Um, I always live like that. I think that's always contributed to the success that I've had is because I just kind of keep it real. And um, we have cannabis companies online right now. They're in the chat room. So it's good for them to hear how we all feel, you know, as a community, as advocates um, in this space. And I just want to tell you guys that I really appreciate that. And I think Tiffany's going to get a couple of questions in before we end. Actually, I'm not because you guys have been answering them oh. and I've been trying to follow the chat. But what we will do is what has come from this is a lot of people wanting to share kind of what they do and they're trying to connect with other people around this because of the words of the ladies and what y'all have said. So one of the things that we're going to push out, and this is to everybody. So Mary listed a couple of books. Everybody has their own website. And a lot of what we are, what everyone heard Kinshasa say is, we looked at these eight kind of sessions, because normally we do these on the campuses, as a way for us to kind of elevate some people in the field that we thought were doing amazing work and maybe aren't getting the same kind of platforms and we wanted to put them directly in front of um, other Black folk and other people of color that are trying to come into this industry. We also wanted students to see that sometimes when the system doesn't create space for you, you make your own, you do your own, and we needed y'all to kind of see what that looks and feels like. We've got eight, the, the series is eight, um, eight individual conversations. We're going to be doing them every week. Um, one of the things that looks like it's coming up is maybe we need to create some kind of, and when we switch platforms, knock on somebody's wood, that there is space on that platform for us to do individual networking as well as small group conversations. And so we're going to add that into it. We're also going to add an expo over time. So if there are people that have businesses that we want to create space for you to see those and to share those kinds of resources with each other. Um, I'm going to ask all of the presenters um, if we could stay on for just a couple of minutes because I want to make sure that we get accurate lists of the books, of the some of the things that you've already created. We want to make sure that we have your websites down so people can go and visit those and support you as, own, as business owners. Um, and then Jason, we had a lot of questions about you. It was really about some of the content, like the educational components of understanding like the complexities of this plan and all it has to offer. So for everyone else, we'll send out something that'll be a summary of this. You'll also have a link. And for those of you that are trying to get the additional equity points, um, if you go and apply with some of the people that decided to sponsor, there is going to be kind of a finishing um, kind of Q&A that you will have to complete. And that's why we're going to make sure that you have a copy to the, to the link and to all the resources in the summary that will help you do that. Um, I think that's all for me trying to sum up everything. Do any of our panelists have kind of a final word they'd like to share? And then Chas, you close us out. Anyone have anything to share? Um, sure. I will end by saying, listen, we always knew about this plan, okay? We've been right. The whole time we've been right, okay? And we were demonized for it, and that's super unfortunate. But the next phase of this is taking over, okay? We're taking advantage, and we're taking over, because we're no longer asking. We're no longer begging and pleading. We are, we are getting what's ours and we're moving on to focus on our communities that have been devastated so much by so many lies from so many places. Um, and this is systematic globally. It's not just, don't think this is just in the US. This is happening in Jamaica. This is happening in Africa. This is happening everywhere. But now is the time to stop the momentum and pull it in our favor. And so with all of these professionals that you have or that you have access to, Mary, that, that inclusive list is everything. You've got to support the people that support you. So make sure you go over there and check that out. Make sure you contact us and make sure you understand that we've been doing this for a long time. We really, we don't mind giving our feedback, but our time is valuable as well. So if you really want to succeed, if you really want to skip ahead, if you really want to learn, consultation is where it's at and a fee is attached to that, okay? So I definitely want to put that out there. We always give out free information on our lives, so make sure you follow us on Instagram. 
I definitely go live every Wednesday on the Georgia Cannabis Coalition website just to update, update you on what's going on in Georgia. So make sure you follow that on IG. And I thank you, Kinshasa, for having me. Oh, thank you, Tanji, and thank you, Mary. Did you want to add anything? No, she she held it down. Great job. Okay. Well, I just want to kind of end by saying that. Um, Jason. Sorry. Oh, Jason, I'm sorry. Jason, the only guy. Sorry, yeah. Jason. Not at all. No, and, and it's definitely important. I, I can't thank uh, Tanji and uh, Mary enough for their perspective. They certainly align and agree with, with all of those observations. And I think the two things that strike me, if I could inspire the group to understand what happened in Illinois, where you're able to bring about uh, policy change by aligning uh, capitalist free market incentives. Um, and so in, within the cannabis industry, you know, changing from a medical to a recreational program, for example, all of these stakeholders stakeholders currently in the space have uh, a big revenue upside and so the responsibility is for them to channel that alongside social equity reparative initiatives with substantial investment and to be able to understand the constructs of capitalism and the difficulty that I think is a key and likewise we're working on accountability mechanisms for not only uh, cannabis companies but every other consumer packaged goods that is selling products into America right now um, there needs to be an accountability mechanism for all of us to say, we acknowledge this problem, we understand this problem, it's manifested itself not only in the cannabis industry, but elsewhere. And so really to begin to put resources and money where our mouths are, um, I, I think that's it's imperative, like you guys mentioned with the time. And so I, I'm thankful to be part of the conversation. I definitely understand I need to listen and I need to act um, from a corporate perspective, likewise a, a personal perspective. So thank you again so much for the opportunity. Oh, thank you, Jason. And um, we look forward to hearing more from Cresco on the rest of our shows. We'll have Kaliva, representatives from Kaliva. We'll have representatives from Cureleaf speaking. So this is a great opportunity for um, anyone, you know, to be able to directly talk to some of these cannabis companies. Um, my goal in doing all of this was so that African-Americans did not have to be reactionary. Um, we're being proactive right now. We are talking to Tangi, we're talking to Mary, we're connecting to the HBCUs. And so that was my goals because being in California, um, I do have privilege, but that privilege doesn't work because I have real estate poverty because I can't afford to pay for something while I'm waiting to apply for something. So there's all of these different constraints, but I do know the privileges that I have and I enjoy sharing them. And I appreciate you all offering your privilege to help all of our efforts um, with what we're doing in this cannabis space. And um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I thank all of the guests today. Um, I thank all of the participants and attendees. Sorry for getting the hop in and the, um, what is this? What are we on? Eventbrite, not Eventbrite. What is this called? Zoom. Zoom, Zoom all mixed up today. Um, we, we're, that hop in is crazy. It's a great platform. We'll have it together next week. Um, just so you know, once you register for one course, um, you've registered for all of the sessions. Just make sure you show up, do well on those Q&As and complete at least 80% of the coursework. And Cresco, Kaliva, TrueLeave, they're all willing and they're all going to accept our certifications and give you all additional equity points. And, you know, this is our part. This is our little thing that we can do. And it's just a step that our goal is to get as many qualified African-Americans into some of these cannabis spaces. I think our focus is getting them out of college into this pipeline. And of course we're, you know, branching out from there, but the goal is, I won't say the goal, what I, what I learned um, with starting to get into this industry is that social equity eligible folks come in all facets. So yes, a lot, I may be black privileged, but I'm social equity eligible because I grew up and I had to be impacted by the war on drugs. So it's like, you know, it's not just someone who's just getting out of jail. It's not someone who's just, you know, impoverished, but it's folks like myself that have access to going to college. And so that's why we targeted these 3% of universities. That's why we targeted the 73% of the folks that receive Pell Grants, which means that they're close to, or they're below the poverty line, which means that it's highly likely that they're social equity eligible. And that's what we wanted to share with this is that we feel like our HBCUs are full of a lot of students who are eligible to work there, eligible to become entrepreneurs, eligible to be activists like Tangi and Mary. So I hope that helps. Um, we hope to see you at the next show. We'll send over some emails. Every week you guys will receive a link so that you may sign on to the show. You will also within that week receive your Q&A and we just ask that you return that prior to the next class. So thank you all.
And also uh, keep in mind, um, spread the word to other individuals. It's still not too late to sign up. Um, for individuals that missed today's session, they will be able to uh, see the uh, recording later on. So uh, if you thought this was helpful and beneficial, uh, please spread the word. And our next session is Cannabis is STEM, and that'll take place on the 14th of July. So we got a lot of cool STEM folks like Jason, um, and they'll also be on the show sharing some of the things that he also shared today and a bit more. And you'll definitely get to see people that look like you in these positions um, that are cannabis STEM professionals. So I thank you all so much. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you.